more happy ones for me. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, can we call it a day? Yeah. As an idol of many young people in this country today, you have a very grave responsibility. It's a grave, yes. How do you propose to exercise, exercise that now? Well, that's very difficult. One uh, perhaps doesn't ask for responsibilities. Perhaps one is given responsibilities when one is uh, uh, pushed into the limelight in, in, in this particular sphere rather than asking to be. And asked to be pushed into this and in a way I've merely asked to be my private life to be uh, left alone, so as it were. To, that my, res that my, my responsibilities, as far as that goes, are only to myself. You know. In, in the public sector, such as to do with my work, my records, and etc., I, uh, I have responsibility. But in, in my private, uh, the, the amount of baths I take or my personal habits are of no uh, consequence to anyone else. I do you mean this that you were picked upon because you are who you are? I don't think we're picked on, picked upon in that way because. But it's just that applies to everybody. I mean, um, yeah. The responsibility only applies to us because who we are. Hey, everybody, how's it going? So we're right back into it. We are now on what I believe is episode 10 of my Rolling Stones London Albums catalog. I'm always nervous now that Gary's going to barge in on my video. But anyway... Here to talk about this album, Flowers. It was released on June 26th, 1967. And already it had been a tumultuous year for the Rolling Stones. Now, the Rolling Stones, 1967, was one of the worst years in their existence. There's no denying that. So we've got to back the story up. Now, in early 1967, January, the News of the World came out with an expose which talked about how all these pop stars are using recreational drugs. And one of the artists that they targeted was the Rolling Stones. There was a reporter, and he claimed that Mick Jagger at a party, they were at a, some sort of club, Mick Jagger offered him a number of illicit substances. Now, it was a case of mistaken identity. It was not Mick Jagger. It was actually Brian Jones, which makes you question whether the reporter himself was on drugs because how you could mistake Brian Jones for Mick Jagger is beyond me. You'd have to be under the influence of something. But nonetheless, all that aside, Mick Jagger was understandably furious when he saw his name in print as having given drugs to a reporter at News of the World. So he sued the paper for libel. Well, in retaliation, the News of the World tipped off the British cops about a party that Keith Richards was having at his estate called Redlands. So on February 12th, actually one day after the Between the Button albums hit the shops in the UK, the police raided a party that he was having at his home. Now among the people at the party were Mick Jagger, Robert Frazier, who was a gallery owner that the Rolling Stones were friends with. I believe Marianne Faithful was at the party, but nonetheless, the cops swarmed in, but they didn't make any arrests at the time. However, a day later, they did arrest Robert Frazier and they did arrest Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and charged them with drug offenses. I don't remember exactly what the charges were, but they were serious charges. So as all that is going down, Andrew Lug Oldham, who is their manager, who you would think would be rising to the occasion and helping them mount some kind of defense to these charges, helping them organize their legal defense. He flees the country. He's like, I'm out of here because he was worried he was going to get arrested. Well, Andrew Lug Oldham, before he had left, and this was not any is not in any way related to the drug bust, but he had hired Alan Klein, yes, that Alan Klein, to be the Rolling Stones business manager. So it was left to Alan Klein to help kind of clean up this mess, help get the Rolling Stones some sort of defense, while Andrew Lug Oldham is somewhere in America uh, 
watching everything from afar. And that is one of the reasons why the Rolling Stones fell out with Andrew Lou Goldham, because he basically abandoned them in their hour of need. The very next month after that happened, in March of 1967, Mick Jagger, his girlfriend at the time, Marianne Faithful, Brian Jones, his girlfriend, Anita Pallenberg, and Keith Richards take a vacation to Morocco. Well, Brian Jones and Anita Pallenberg had not been on the best of terms. Their relationship had been very rocky of late. And while they were in Morocco, it got even worse. They had a huge argument. Apparently, Brian Jones beat the crap out of Anita Pallenberg, and she went running right into the arms of Keith Richards. Brian Jones ended up in the hospital. I believe he might have, he had some sort of overdose or he had a, a exhaustion, a mental breakdown. And Keith Richards and Anita Pallenberg split. They left Morocco, left him there in the hospital. And Anita and Keith would be, in, they would be lovers for the next 12 years. And that basically contributed to the downfall of Brian Jones. His drug use accelerated. It did not help that on May 10th, 1967, the day that Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Robert Frazier were arraigned in connections with the bust at Redlands, Brian Jones's home was raided by police. He was arrested and charged with possession of cannabis, which he said, I believe he said it was either planted or somebody had sent him and he didn't realize what it was. But nonetheless, now there are three Rolling Stones who are up on charges of drug possession and drug offenses. At the end of June, Keith Richards and Mick Jagger went on trial. Mick Jagger received a three-month prison sentence for the possession of four amphetamine tablets. Keith Richards was found guilty of allowing cannabis to be smoked on his property. Can you even imagine, like in this day and age, and he was sentenced to a year in prison, a year in prison for allowing cannabis to be smoked in his home. Yeah, they basically threw the book at him. Now, both Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were imprisoned immediately after the trial. However, the last day they were released pending their appeal of their convictions. And to their credit, the London Times ran a very famous editorial. It was called Who Breaks a Butterfly Upon a Wheel, in which conservative editor William Reese Mogg was critical of the sentence, basically pointing out, Look, if Mick had Mick Jagger and Keith Richards had been any ordinary citizen, there is no way they would have gotten that heavy of a sentence. So basically they felt the courts were punishing them for being celebrities who were using drugs. And I think this is where the Rolling Stones bad boy image came back to bite them in the ass. And in interviews at the time, John Lennon was, was saying, and he said for years afterwards, if it had been any one of the Beatles, they would have let us go. They wouldn't have done anything. They would have looked the other way. Now, that would prove to be true in the later part, later part of the 60s, but back when the Beatles still had that clean mop-top image, the authorities were kind of willing to let things slide. But because the Rolling Stones were the bad boys and because they were pop stars and they allegedly were flaunting their drug use, they got in trouble big time. So that is basically the environment in which this album was released. What a year already, holy smokes. Now, I don't even know what to call this album. You could call it a compilation. You could call it a US only. I mean, that's really the only thing to call it is a US only kind of a compilation in the spirit like yesterday and today was a compilation. You have on here some leftover tracks that appeared on the UK version of Aftermath and the UK version of Between the Buttons. You've got three tracks which were left over from the UK Aftermath album, and you've got two tracks which were left off Between the Buttons. You got three songs which were entirely new to the UK market, although this album did not appear in the UK. And then you got some singles. Uh, I mean, you've got Let's Spend the Night Together and Ruby Tuesday. 
Only a few months after those songs were released on the Between the Buttons album, like Can We Let It Breathe, You Got It As A Single, You Got It On Between the Buttons, You have Got It On The Flower album. Like, I understand it's a popular single, but I, for the life of me, I, I don't get what that single is doing on here. When Between the Buttons is still selling in the shops, it makes no sense at all, other than London Records was really running out of material, and they had no choice but to put it on here, I guess. You've got the single, Have You Seen Your Mother Baby Standing in the Shadow, which had not appeared on a U.S. album before. But it's this album really has no identity. I don't know what to call it. I don't know if it's a studio album proper in the U.S., if that's what it was intended to be. I don't know if it's meant to be like a big hits High Tide and Green Grass kind of a compilation. I, I really don't know what to make of it. It's just kind of baffling when you see the songs that are on here. I mean, it's a, it's a money-making venture, a cash cow. There's no other way really to characterize it. The cover itself, these are the photographs. They took them from the Aftermath cover. And, you know, it reflects the flower power psychedelic times here. Now, the story goes that Mick and Keith, as a prank, did not put any petals on Brian Jones' flower stem. I don't know how true that is, but that's apparently like a little inside joke going on. And it was known Mick and Keith were picking on Brian Jones pretty ruthlessly since uh, 1966. He, they were kind of elbowing him. Uh, out of his position as leader in the band. And to be fair, Brian Jones could be kind of a dick at times. So, you know, I don't want to say it was entirely unjustified, but it was a bad year for the Stones. It was a bad year for Brian Jones. And they're kind of piling on if that story is true. But nonetheless, the covers, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of this cover, but it is what it is. Anyway, so... Let's get into the songs on this album. The very first song is Ruby Tuesday, which we've already talked about in our Between the Buttons episode. Love it. One of my favorite Rolling Stones songs. And then you have the very chaotic, very psychedelic, very hypermanic Have You Seen Your Mother Baby Standing in the Shadows, which it didn't do too well as a single. I think it was kind of off-brand for the Rolling Stones. It was just... You got brass on there, which um, somebody commented uh, Brian Jones was playing the horns on there. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what somebody said. And it's just a, a very uh, wild, chaotic arrangement. Very strange choice for a single. I happen to like it. Uh, I, I think Jack Nietzsche uh, played piano on it. Jack Nietzsche was a um, friend of Phil Spector, helped him produce uh, some albums. And he was playing on some Rolling Stones records. Uh, then we've got the A side of the Ruby yeah. Tuesday single, Let's Spend the Night Together. Uh, you've got Lady Jane, which appeared on the Aftermath album. And you've got Out of Time, um, one of my favorite tracks off the Aftermath album here in an abbreviated alternate mix. And the last track on side one is My Girl, which I consider to be one of the Rolling Stones' worst songs. No idea why they decided to cover it, or if they covered it, why it found a home here. It belongs as a B-side or one of those unreleased gems that would end up on a bootleg. Cannot stand that song. That song had never appeared on a U.S. album before, and it would never appear in the U.K., at least not officially to my knowledge. On side two, you've got Two tracks that were left off the Between the Buttons album. You've got Backstreet Girl, where you've got that French accordion. It's got a very light and airy arrangement, but the subject matter is basically talking about a one-night stand. you got Please Go Home, which is kind of a psychedelic Chuck Berry-inspired uh, riff. Uh, Mother's Little Helper, which, of course, was on Aftermath. It was a single in the U.S. Take It or Leave It, which... I'm okay with it. I don't love the song. I don't hate the song. It's just sort of one of those middle-of-the-road Rolling Stones tracks. You've got Ride On Baby, which I love the harpsichord. I'm a heavy metal, metal fan, so that's probably why I love the harpsichord so much. But I love that harpsichord on there. I almost feel like this could have been a single. 
Call Me Out of My Mind, but I love this song. I think it's great. I think it's a nice little pop gem. And then Sitting on a Fence, which I was kind of ready to say one of those, eh, just a ho-hum track, but I listened to it again today and I'm like, I, I actually kind of like that. It's strictly acoustic based. It's almost like a folk song, if you will, but I do like it. I like it more than I thought I did as I re-listened to it today. So that's how we close the album. So anyway, this is just kind of a, you know, a thrown together compilation. It, like December Children, it is not a cohesive album, but I'm glad to have it as part of the catalog. I'd rather have it than not. We got it, the UK didn't. Um, so there, that is my take uh, on this album. So what do I own of this album? Well, this is a mono repress. I don't have an original pressing. I would love to get a stereo pressing. I'd love to get an original mono pressing, but as of right now, this is all I have ever been able to obtain or find. This is the original CD version of Flowers with the typical black with white lettering, uh, back cover artwork, whatever you will. And this is the SACD version where they do replicate the artwork from the back cover on here pretty faithfully. And then you open it up and you've got the typical, the custom CD. Uh, and then you've got, I don't know what it is, some sort of variation on the back cover artwork. And you open it up and you've got the track listing there and just some information about what the heck an SACD is. So anyway, that is my deep dive into the Flowers album. Hope you're doing great. And, you know, I've had some people commenting, like, keep the series going. And, you know, okay, the London Records catalog technically runs through Get Your Yaya's Out. So I'm starting to reconsider ending it at this album. I think what I will probably do is go through, at least let it bleed, possibly. I got to do Get Your Yaya's Out. It's one of the greatest live albums of all time. So let's call it that. I'll do it till Get Your Yaya's Out. Hope you're doing great. And thanks for all the comments.